this is slightly awkward. This is a postscript um, introduction before uh, that I'm going to tack on this recording that has already been recorded. Um, so this recording is going to have two introductions. Um, but just wanted to say that uh, this recording is essentially an extension of my commentary and response to the Michael Knowles, Michael Malice exchange. Um, but it also pertains to Revel Wisdom, but kind of in a, in a synthesis. So yeah, the, the content of this recording um, might need sort of the context of that other recording, which this is essentially an extension to. So if you're interested in these themes, it's probably useful to take both of those together. Uh, uh, this recording is going to primarily be a critique of rebel wisdom, uh, but it also, I think, involves uh, Michael Malice's point uh, or at least the the kinds of pol politics or the kinds of political philosophy and 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 stance that he was taking in his in discussion with uh, Michael Knowles, and um, although I I can't be sure about what Michael Malice's um, perhaps elaborated position is on this kind of issue. Um, but I think that he is vulnerable to, to the general sort of polemic that, that I'm about to mount. So I, I think I'm, I'm very grateful that we suffer through Twitter and Twitter mobs and um, uh, let's say that this, this horrible um, synergy between Twitter and corporate policy, that, that corporate policy is malleable to the groupthink and, and the mob and, and a kind of, um, kind of loose consensus, which is basically fundamentally unprincipled. Um, it's just, you know, sort of the spirit of the times, or are you on the right side of, of history as it, as it appears, as it's being framed by, you know, sort of the vacuous, um, lens of uh, uh, social justice that you know is, is almost like a kind of pillaging band of, of um, you know always thirsty for for some kind of blood so that it can prove that it's sort of making cultural progress because all of its progress is essentially in the realm of thought control and in the realm of infantilizing culture and bringing it to heel under its vision of a kind of um, monoculture and, and a... And a um, now, my... my so, so, I mean, the reason why I'm roping Michael Malice into this is because how does he know that his vision of anarchism that has its decentralized justice system doesn't get yoked by a similar structure you know, maybe when we remove government, we end up promoting a kind of cultural self-governance, which occurs in the form of, of, of the Twitter and people having to sort of forge an overt cultural consensus in which the mob is, is paid its due and um, placated. So, so, so as to sort of supplement for, you know, the idea that if you dissolve the state, suddenly people become sort of morally virtuous. Now, I have made the case myself for a kind of moral anarchism and um, the necessity for that. Um, but the idea that if you sort of remove all structure and backbone, that, um, that you're going to get a more sophisticated moral uh, ethos, uh, rather than some kind of lowest common denominator moral ethos that will be governed by some, you know, sort of vague script, uh, you know, uh, stricture, which, uh, Michael Malice can, you know, sort of simplify and, you know, sort of, I guess you're going to have to generate some kind of political Bible around that. You're going to have to create some kind of orthodoxy, 
to, to, to stop the culture, you know, in the same way that the American Constitution has offered that kind of um, ethos. But even the American Constitution, I think, has, has failed because of its inability to kind of cope with its own contradictions in its, in, in its structural deployment, in, 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 its, um, in its functioning. Okay, anyways, that's how I'm roping in Michael Malice to all of this. So, now I'm commenting on primarily uh, the Rebel Wisdom. I think I watched, a five, I think it was like a five minute video on, uh, on um, I don't know, is it David? I'm so bad with names. Um, Patrick, oh my word awful with names anyway um but the 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 guy with the beard from fr fr from rebel wisdom was explaining how uh, his ivy micton controversy journalism sort of uh documentary film was taken off youtube and he appealed it and it wasn't reinstated and then there was a Twitter controversy and then they got it reinstated. And, you know, and, and he's basically saying, well, you know, we're, we don't, this is not what we deserve, you know, because we've been hard on other people. Now, I, I'm, I take task with rebel wisdom for playing into the intellectual sympathy grifting of, well, this is a nuanced and complicated issue that uh, platforms must do something against misleading information. And, you know, the dangers of free speech absolutism, you know, this is what they trot out. And this is, you know, sort of the hard skepticism. Now, I, I just want to point out the moral inconsistency in rebel wisdom's um, position, because it, it is it does boil down to a moral inconsistency here, an inconsistency in the character with which they want to have this sophisticated, intellectual, nuanced, you know, sort of exploration of these issues. Now, look, I, I know what Rebel Wisdom's position is. Their position is quite clear. They want there to be an absolute transparency that is, let's say, uh, that, that has a a fidelity to all the available truth at the time so that they don't want people saying things when they are in fact controversial so so you know so you you can't give your partisan point of view of something and diminish or you know um sorry what's the word minimize or or skate over or ignore that there are, you know, you, you can't create a, um, a reality tunnel with your content. That, that's basically um, Rebel Wisdom's position. That if you, you can state a hard partisan point of view, but you have to sort of give play to the fact that there is a, um, uh, there, is, there is a disagreement about it. And so sort of minimizing that there is a disagreement or... or um, Concealing that, essentially, is a kind of is 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 uh, is, is perhaps a, a problematic threat to the audience because they're going to be misled into like a fake reality. Now, the idea that you're going to police people for not being transparent enough about their truth claims or about some kind of fidelity to the concept of truth means that you have already impoverished the audience, the individual, the, the, the denizen of culture into an infantile role within cultural production. So you want platforms to take precautions or at least that they should have the liberty to take precautions against potentially dangerous and misleading content. Now, as soon as you take that line, First of all, you've already used the dictum of, of the totalitarian. You're cultivate, and, and you're also part of, of fueling your own problem here because you're cultivating eggshells. Because the more precaution you justify, yet the further precaution you're going to need to deploy 
in order to double down and and um, uh, uh, make make your your initial um, strategy uh, uh, dignified. So so you kind of fall into your own moral hazard uh, because you are be you become part of exacerbating the problem. Because obviously the real solution is that people need to do their own investigation or they need to. Um, jumped ahead a, a bit too far but but people essentially need to develop their own resilience you know they they say that the plural of anecdote is evidence and that we must have rules against people generalizing anecdotes i think that that is an important lesson that people need to learn in a culture that has liberal values and principles and free speech. That that, that is the basic um, idea, that, that when you're listening to someone, know that essentially they might be swayed by anecdote. And, and interpreting evidence from anecdote, you know, is um, is something that is going to be quashed if people filter out anecdotally premised um, stances and takes on things are, are, are going to be swept aside by someone, uh, um, by some censor, and, and you're going to have actually a very distorted view of reality because, you know, because of this, this stupid rule that essentially, well, um, don't be swayed by anecdote. And so if no one is swayed by anecdote, we don't see the reports. We, 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 we don't see the, the noise. In, 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 you know, we don't have access to witnessing the pattern. Yes, the pattern might be misleading, but um, it's there to be interpreted. It's there to be interpreted by the individual. And, I mean, this also is important because then when you... I mean, you know, it's called, man, I'm, I'm jumping around a bit, a bit too much, it, but it's called YouTube. It's not called mainstream tube. You know, there, there are, let's say, psychologically speaking, cult leaders out there. There are charlatans. There are quacks. There, there are, you know, self-aggrandizing, you know, um, the, the, the idea that you're going to protect people from these kinds of personalities rather than exposing them to them and, and having them develop their own kind of resilience to these things is, 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 is utterly... You know, the idea that you need to prevent harm at all costs, at the cost to liberal values, is, is something that is uh, a perverse sort of vortex of, of it, 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 it's, un, it's not a sustainable proposition. So, look, and, and, and I mean, yeah, the, the, the problem here is that, you know, YouTube potentially has the right to do this because it's a, um, I mean, I, I think that, uh, the, that the law should be restructured so that it doesn't essentially have the right to do this, or if it does, it, it does so being being a publisher um the the that the, 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 they there does need to be um you know if platforms are going to be platforms uh they can have certain benefits but if they're not going to be platforms that are congruent with basic liberal principles and values then uh the, 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 they mustn't have uh platform protections for, from liability. Um, and, I mean, perhaps hypocritically, I said the only exception would be essentially around sex or around age-appropriate content. I think age-appropriate content um, is, is essentially the, the, the only sort of viable distinction to be had here. Um, 
in terms of, of you could call it um, censorship uh, to some degree. But anyway, I, I, I don't think that that's... Um, That that kind of censorship uh, uh, psychologically infantilizes the audience. So, okay, so so the moral inconsistency that I'm talking about is that if you've already conceded that platforms have the duty to thought control in order to stop people from being misled and acting to their own detriment, if you've already call that a sophisticated, moral, nuanced issue that needs, that's very complicated, and you have intellectual sympathy to, well, as long as they have the right rationale when they perform their, their function of, of thought control, it, 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 it's, it's a stupid distinction. It, it's a distinction without a difference. You've already morally infantilized the audience. Uh, you've already also sort of... Um, you know, you, you, you've clipped the wings of the audience to, uh, and, and you've also impoverished everyone as well, because now we've got a distorted landscape of expression. We don't have a representation of personality and people in the world as well. Yes, perhaps there should be a corner of YouTube that's full of conspiracy theorists and other people. And we need to learn how to, in a transparent way, culturally digest and deal with that. The idea that this needs to be performed by kind of gatekeepers is already to, 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 to drop the ball. You know, if you want to make an argument that Brett Weinstein is, is a problematic person because he hasn't framed it transparently enough, um, you know, have as it, but the, uh, okay, I, I know that Rebel Wisdom actually made it a point that, that they did not agree with, with the, um, with the censorship that was applied to Brett Weinstein, so perhaps the, that's, that's a bad, um, point to raise, but, uh, although I, I think they, they have, um, They have criticized Brett for uh, not being as balanced as he should be. And, and that's a fair comment to make and to potentially have hashed out. But I would say that um, rebel wisdom has this horrible tendency to let the morality get fuzzy because, because of some rationale that is given. Be, be, because there's some headline, there's some auspice, there's some aegis under which you can potentially have a rationalization which is self-consistent. And just because you have a self-consistent rationalization doesn't mean that it's not a morally untenable position and an unsustainable form of, of cultural uh, infantilism. Okay, so I mean, I, I have, okay, I haven't made... A strict argument, but I've made a kind of inductive framing of, of these issues. And um, sorry, there, there, there were a few other things here, but yeah. So, and and there is there is a there is always corruption that happens when things get manipulated away from freedom of expression and and um, free speech, essentially. And how things get manipulated is because you know, for, for good reason, experts and people in a field, you know, don't want to hear about your anecdotes because they already have a story about it because, let's say, that the current, the, the current um, aggregate of the knowledge in the field has a preponderance of the evidence that leads to a particular interpretation already. And so anecdotes that don't conform with that interpretation are essentially um, sort of intellectually prejudiced. There's a bias against them. 
or, or there, there, there's some kind of explanation. Now, this is this is a form of corruption, particularly because you know knowledge is never settled in some sense, especially scientific knowledge is never settled, and so. just lost my own thread now because there's sort of there are two points around here so this is a recurring sort of cultural corruption that happens around experts but also experts forget their own humility they forget what they don't know in a field people know very little about the immune system we know a great deal but there's probably more that we don't know about the immune system it's actually quite complicated it's so complicated that we really don't un understand the majority of stuff that goes on in in immune type stuff like it's almost like magic it really is there's a lot of immune stuff which is really i mean we know all the biochemistry we've known all the biochemistry in the body for a long time but how these things work synergistically and and the actual uh you know is um Anyway, so, so when, when we've aggregated things into a particular consensus and then there's a consensus view about how these anecdotal outliers get framed and, and interpreted, um, I think that when, when that starts translating into a kind of censorship, you get very dangerous distortions of reality. Because then you've got a self-referential dogma that is not able to be reminded of, let's say, the opportunity for um, uh, a reconciliation and a reframing of, of the field itself even. And, you know, this is basically forgotten when experts never show the vulnerability of their own field itself. That the state of, you know, they never opine on the state of the field itself. Because if they did, it would really, you know, it would be to throw not just a pinch of salt, but, you know, like a bucket of salt on, on you know, over their heads. You know, they, they would look like buffoons. Um, making the kinds of, of um, certain uh, uh, statements that, that they make, etc., etc. And, and prescriptions that follow from their thing. And, you know, and, and they don't even give a kind of differential prognosis or, or, or you know, they, they, I mean, if you want to talk about people that don't talk about the other side, that they don't transparently talk about the controversy or, or about sort of the different schools of thought, they don't even make mention of them, that that is, is exactly what we're sort of fighting here. Because if you're already giving yourself the license to crack down on people misleading other people for not being transparent enough, you've already committed yourself to the outcome and not to the fidelity of the process. You, you, you've already focused in on just trying to um, engineer a culture and or, or, or a, um, I mean, you, 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 you've already sort of created a kind of secretariat of, of a kind of central human authority over culture or, or at least one that is capable of supposedly protecting basic liberal principles by enforcing a kind of transparency or at least that would be the I think that that would be the version the steel man version that rebel wisdom uh, says is, is a is a sophisticated nuanced topic that, that that can't just you know you can't just be a free speech absolutist that's their position But yeah, the, the, but essentially in, in that, in wanting to have that discussion, and I have also criticized them when they've made this argument before. I've got specific recordings where I, I probably make the same thematic point that I'm making now. 
is that people need to perform their own transparency filter. And if they don't, then, you know, they are perhaps dangerous people and, the, uh, and, and they need to disabuse themselves of not having a transparency filter. If people don't value transparency, if, if, and, and this is it's, it's quite ironic because here you have the people who are trying to solve the problem who are exacerbating the problem because, you know, the, the, the real solution is for the individual audience to develop a transparency filter to some degree or to, you know, work out some way of, of checking the transparency of their own endorsed viewpoints and positions. And, you know, one, one of the biggest things about transparency is probably the level of uncertainty tracking, let's say, the, door of, the doors of uncertainty that you are aware of, and then there are also unknown unknowns as well. Um, and as long as one is generally mindful of those sorts of concepts I, 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 and, and sort of has some kind of practi pr practical... Um, employment of, of, of those, you know, kinds of uh, aspects of the unfolding experience of, of uh, um, I'm going to use some horrible words, collective sense-making. Um, but uh, essentially, the reason why I say that this is morally corrupted and, and inconsistent and unsustainable as well is because on, on, on a very prime moral level, what you're doing is you're saying that understanding does not rest in the individual audience mind. The, the condition of their mind is not important. The quality of that condition is not important. It's the content. You, that, 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 that is real estate that must be owned by the sensor or it must be filtered by the sensor. That, that, that content must be placed there and that content must be safe. But the understanding of the individual to have the right to filter their own information. I mean, I, I did make another argument uh, in another recording. And, you know, YouTube, it's, to my mind, Rebel Wisdom has really dropped the ball on this because they conflate the issue of algorithms with this issue. It's not the same issue. And there are also ways around algorithms as well. You could create a YouTube interface which has an independent index of YouTube videos and kind of has a network of relevancy between videos so that when people search a particular search command it will come up with you know videos if you to click on and if you click on those videos the suggested videos on the side will not be provided by YouTube will be pr provided also by the index system to, to essentially show how the content of that recording is is relevant to other to other videos so that essentially people won't be vortexed into a rabbit hole based on loose association, but will stay fixed according to their initial search. Because I believe that it's the curatorship of the suggestions, which is also this kind of infantilizing element. And anyway, the, the issue with the infantilizing element is that it denigrates the individual understanding. It fundamentally infantilizes that thing under some external authority or some external um, filtration system. And if you don't know the intelligence of the thing that you are implicitly trusting or implicitly relying on, you are essentially a kind of, uh, you know, you're entering into a kind of slave moral compact where your morality is being subjugated or is, is at least being a kind of client. Or, or, or a consumer, a consumer whose understanding is being fundamentally, um, I always forget this word, it starts with an S, uh, uh, um, 
subtract um, anyway it, 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 it's being um, undercut essentially and when the understanding is being undercut that is a kind of unsustainable infantilism okay, I'm repeating my point over and over again let me try and find a new one uh, So, the idea that the audience cannot be trusted to, to develop their own transparency filter. Is essentially a kind of totalitarian cultural dictum. One that has a kind of moral domino that if you're already capable of doing that to the individual's understanding, then they, they might as well just be a kind of real estate that you are funneling content into in order to have some kind of optimized outcome according to the senses interpretation of uh, best practice. And in the meantime, we get anecdotal expressions. There, there, there could be a kind of democracy on YouTube. That was how it was originally, that there was literally a democracy on YouTube, a democracy of, of ideas. Uh, um, now we have something else. We have something manipulated and contorted and twisted, and then we have the, 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 the intellectual sympathy providers like rebel wisdom who say no 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 this is a complicated issue so we must uh, as long as the rationale lines up and is is kind of being applied with some kind of values or principles that's you know that, that that's justifiable or or at least it's it's uh, reasonable the, the, i mean it might be reasonable in some rational way but it's not morally sustainable. And is this lack of morality and, and this lack of, of principle, which is what is boiling democracy alive uh, as well, and, and liberal open democracy, um, because of providing intellectual sympathy for, for this kind of stuff. And so, so, so when it actually proves with, beyond a doubt that it is not principally interested in truth seeking um, I would say that when it when it removes misleading information it's also principally not interested in truth seeking because it is trying to curate for the audience for the individual how to even filter their own information space that they don't want their audience to be able to discern what is wrong and what is right what is true and, and, and what is false. I still feel like I'm failing in making this link. Um, and then once you've cultivated the eggshell framework of cultivating the audience as an eggshell, uh, sorry, uh, I, I'm not even saying, when I say eggshell, I mean it comes from legal analogy that eggshell skull, that when you have a skull, the thickness of an eggshell, anything is going to break your skull. So you, so do we put padding on everything in the world or do you have to walk around with a helmet on is basically the, the question. And maybe when you go into YouTube, the first thing I should ask you is, do you have an eggshell skull? And if you click yes or no, you experience a completely different version of YouTube. I mean, you know, at least then it's in the hands of the individual. Um, but uh, 
so sorry, so, 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 so let me try to make this um, point again. So the, the rebel wisdom Yeah, so I mean, essentially, the idea that it is possible to, what's the word, curate or, no, no, um, what's the word, I called sort of administrators or editors, uh, ad, I, I guess, uh, moderators, yeah, the, the, the idea that you're going to moderate content for um, not being misleading is already fundamentally misleading in the treatment or you know, it's a self-defeating um, You know, it, it, it's a. Uh, you know, it, it's almost designed to explode, into a kind of totalitarian cultural. Um, you know, it's it's a kind of it's a self fueling, cultural crutch, that which continues to. Um, cripple and and degrade the ability to go without the crutch you know it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy so okay i guess that's a kind of inductive moral argument now the idea is you know is oh, okay well imagine someone makes a youtube comment uh, sorry a, a youtube video that like tells them oh you know if you if you consume this poison it will actually do something good for you you know, if, if there is content like that, which is in some sense I think is criminal, I mean, obviously, you know, the, this stuff should be meted by the justice system. In fact, I would even argue from a kind of structural point of view, it would have been better if they did absolutely nothing until the courts mandated that they moderate certain kinds of content based on certain kinds of criteria that were sort of judicially um, expounded on in decisions or or at least uh, was promulgated by legislature is it america's governmental and legal framework is makes that a little bit difficult because government shall make no law um, but I think that that would be probably um, justifiable in that essentially it would be uh, essentially part of, of a kind of criminal law um, in that the speech itself is not the, the problem, it's the kind of, it's the negligence or the intention to um, impel other people to, to um, uh, act to their own detriment. And, you know, there can still be accountability for people's speech. So if people make pronouncements, if they make content, which is fundamentally, you know, negligent on the level of, of criminal culpability, you know, have at it. Um, And that, that is really where accountability needs to, to come from. It needs to come from the legal system, not from private vigilantism and cultural sort of spin doctors or sort of indoctrinators or thought controllers is, is, is basically um, where this has to lead to. And as I say, the, the only exception to what I'm saying is basically um, age-appropriate content, I think, is the only exception to any of this stuff. That at some age of majority, you can't do this stuff. It's an insult. And it's also, as I say, it's fundamentally, it's a never-ending uh, 
sort of self-fueling quagmire that just continues to vortex out of control. Okay, so, okay, I think I've... flog the dead horse now and uh, yeah I think that's basically the point now I I just want to say that the situation that we have fallen into I think is is more than capable of developing under a decentralized or anarch anarchic system which is why I'm not a proponent of of state anarchism. I'm, uh, I'm a proponent of a kind of moral and philosophical anarchism that the, that the liberal, that the open liberal state makes itself intellectually robust against because then you have an apparatus, you have processes and procedures and a, and a governmental framework which will have a kind of integrity, fidelity, self-consistency check but it will also be vulnerable to individuals making peculiar claims against it, but that mean that there isn't a lopsided power differential between those who man the state and individuals who happen to perhaps be in a, in a minority that didn't get what they voted for. It's the only way to coherently mediate that kind of, you know, because, and this is also why I'm against sort of Michael Moles' idea that, you know, that, that you, you must legislate morality and that you, you need the state to kind of be a kind of moral authoritarian in some sense. And I don't want to say I, I disagree with that framing of the state entirely, but I do believe that the state does need a bootstrapped justice system and it needs to have a serviceable and justifiable justice system. So I am a kind of, I guess you could call me a kind of judicial authoritarian, because without the judiciary, there is no guarantee that you will sustain liberal open values. You need to overcome the, the, the liberal paradox, that you cannot toler tolerate intolerance and, and stuff like that. And it's under that kind of principle and maxim that you can't tolerate intolerance that I say that that what YouTube is doing is is a is a kind of um, is is deeply problematic and the state if you had I think a proper constitution and a proper legal framework you wouldn't even need the legislature to step in you could get the courts you could compel the courts uh, with basic rights and values to enforce a kind of, um, or, or uh, I mean, they would have to slightly edit the the current legislation around, or is it Section 230, um, or is it 232? I, I, I can't remember, but, you know, the, the, the kind of, the thing that you, you, you would have to expand on the definition or the requirements of a platform which means that you would basically break the, the, the legislative fiat at that point. But, I mean, essentially, I'm, I believe that the legislative fiat needs to be brought under heel of, of a judicial legal framework that has a strong constitution and has enough substantive levers in it and rights and structure in it of exactly how those rights can be limited, exactly the kinds of questions that need to be asked in terms of how light, uh, rights are infringed. And so when your rights are infringed by another uh, private entity like YouTube, by abusing, let's say, public policy, Section 232, or, or 230, or, or uh, you know, anyway. So, but uh, look, it's it's making comparative law um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's very uncomfortable uh, for me to talk about a kind of hypothetical counterfactual idea when we've got a, a separate legal system um, in place it's going to sound very strange like I'm just sort of you know you know uh, what's it called um, 
you know, that I've got this strange magical pipe dream that is going to fix all, all the problems. But, um, and it, it's too much of a, of a distraction to go into that, but essentially, um, th this also goes against, uh, this uh, is, a, is more of me um, criticizing Michael Malice, uh, uh, similarly in my last recording, that um, you, need, you can't have a decentralized justice. I mean, ideally, there would be one template of a republic, and, and people would have, um, not, not that there would be one nation in the world, I don't believe that, but I'm saying that as republics need to have justice etched into the republic, not etched into the democracy. America call, calls themselves a, a democratic republic or, or, or a Republican democracy, or, or I, I, I don't know. It, it's just, it, the whole thing is, um, is convoluted in such a way that you get, it means that you basically have to constantly fight a culture war in America, which, I mean, maybe it has its benefits. I mean, look, as a, as a political compromise, it might be actually, because it forces the people to understand what's going on in politics, it's a kind of engine of history, um, to some degree, uh, and uh, I mean, anyway, the, the, the founding fathers in the American structure, um, certainly uh, were not fools. And I would even argue that the American system is designed to at some point be fulfilled and to be perfected because you'll notice that all the rights in the American Bill of Rights are not in the main body of the Constitution. They are in the amendment section. So somehow they knew they didn't quite know what they were doing. Somehow they knew that it was a kind of experiment. Uh, that the one there's a problem with experimenting with human beings is that you're essentially treating them like lab rats, which is exactly what the individual citizen in America is treated like. They are infantilized by the legislature, essentially. And they're very very thin lines in the sand or very hard to discern lines in the sand of, of constitutional defense against the state. That's, that's what I call the Napoleonic corruption and I don't think that the Napoleonic corruption ends just because you institute anarchism and you tear down the whole system. I think it only ends when you have a justice system that is actually justifiable within some kind of theory of the state which accepts its own limitation as it were and then you can have an optimized society then you can i think get everything that you want you just can't get it all through politics anyway i'm sorry i'm babbling on too many different topics now but um So, yeah, I mean, I'm actually very pleased that we have this, let's say, the, the cultural corruption of Twitter, because I think it serves exactly as a mirror to the scale of the problem that we have to surmount. We cannot try to solve the culture war without squarely confronting the depth of the problem, which is also the human condition. And when we try to sort of sequester and concentrates this problem into just politics and we've got a political system that is fundamentally unwieldy 
because it's prone to the Napoleonic corruption. The only structure that is not prone to the Napoleonic corruption is South Africa, which has also fallen to the Napoleonic corruption, but simply because of the personnel involved, because of the overt corruption and institutionalized corruption, where on paper, it, it, it's all working backwards. I mean, essentially, I, I, I mean, I don't know, I would call that a banana republic. I mean, I would say South Africa already is a kind of tin pot banana republic. Um, it's just that instead of an overt tin horn dictator, we've got a um, we've got this fascistic cultural ideology of of identitarianism of you know black national racialist fervor and and collectivist pride the the pro the political project of which essentially makes leaders unaccountable they, they don't have to perform because they have a different set of criteria because there's a kind of there's a systemic accountability that the population in some sense has to actually fulfill its role in in living up to the the totalitarian dictum and the standards of of you know sort of you know, that the individual understanding and the individual freedom is circumvented by a systematized project now maybe i'm slightly hypocritical because i believe that you do need some kind of systematized structure and bulwark but that it should be as minimalist as possible it should be as bootstrapped as possible and that essentially it should be focused in the judiciary and the legal system because if you don't mediate conflict if you don't mediate disagreements then freedoms become negatory you know then one person's freedom is the freedom to you know where does your freedom end and the other person's freedom begin where, where do, you know you have you have to have some way of sustainably measuring and conserving the metrics of measurement of these things and it's not going to be a perfect system in terms of the decisions the decisions are going to evolve based on maybe maybe I'm wording this slightly incorrectly, but the, but the legal tests are going to evolve. But the principles and values and the core structure of those principles and values and rights need to be enshrined in, a, in an absolute way, in, in a stable way, that then gets defined and refined by, you know, because life gets more complicated sometimes, because sometimes different things happen. And you have different scenarios and you have you have to apply old principles to new circumstances and new complications of how certain rights are now sort of in a, in a different way um, interacting with one another potentially um, But I must be very careful because that can almost sound like, well, you know, you, you, you say, well, all of these things are involved and all of these things are involved. And therefore, you can just kind of conflate them and try to sort of maximize the best recipe just because somebody else is complaining that these things are connected. And which is actually why in the South African constitution, the limitations clause, which is the, which is uh, the section of the bill of rights that says that rights can only be infringed according to the limitations clause, that it actually, the, the considerations that are given are subordinate considerations. The sub clauses in the limitations clause, are all about measuring the purpose of the right and the purpose of, of uh, um, uh, the extent of the limitation and the purpose for, for, for uh, achieved in limiting the right. And, and so all of those sub clauses, you know, get into kind of pragmatic trade offs. 
and, and potential alternatives to not infringing the right or not infringing the right as much that if, if, if there's another course of action to do that. So all of those things are subordinated by, it says, it must be justifiable in an open liberal democratic society. So if you're trying to do something that diminishes the open liberal nature of, of the democracy, you can't do it. So in some sense, free speech would be one of these things, except if it was being limited a little bit, just a little bit. And so I would say that, you know, a limiting speech because of age appropriateness on a platform would fall into that category. Because that is, in some way, a limitation of freedom of expression. If your content that you're going to publish is not going to be available to young children's eyes. But that is not, but if they grow up, then they can read it later. So that's fine. So, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, um, would argue that probably the consumption of content might be lowered to below the voting age. That freedom, that, you know, so that you should not be prejudiced in your ability to consume content probably by the age of 17 unless we're going to just to kind of be consistent with democracy but it, it might also be generally I think it would actually be good to increase the voting age beyond 18 I think 18 is too young but um I believe in Japan the voting age is 25, but um, anyway. Or if we could finish school earlier if um, matriculation or uh, uh, finishing your, your secondary schooling happens by the age of 17, because it just, to me, it seems slightly strange that, you know, you're still going to be in school potentially when you get the vote, that already it's kind of creating a weird kind of perverse incentive that you've just spent so much of your life under the tutelage of the states and now you're given a, a, a tool Anyway, this is this is an irrelevant uh, tangent. Excuse me, but um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, I've... let me stop this recording. It's gone on long enough. <laughs>